my name is Zach. I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech, and today I'm going to be talking about non-contact hook bar lap splice of large reinforcing bars. This was a study that is underway. It's being funded by the Virginia Department of Transportation, and I'm working on this with Dr. Eric Schock and Dr. Karen roberts Woman. So I'll be presenting on our behalf today. So first of all, why would one want to use a non-contact hook bar lap splices? Well, a big potential use of this technology would be in precast concrete construction. In precast concrete construction, we have this problem when we have to connect these elements, which is that when we use precast concrete, we want to use as little as possible, you know, cast in place concrete, right? But when we want to connect these adjacent elements together, we have to have some sort of connection that thus requires a closure pore of cast in place concrete. If that closure pore is oftentimes the size of it is dictated by our connection, right? And oftentimes we want it to be in compliance with the code. This involves a lengthy lap splice of straight reinforcing bars, class B lap splice. And even if these are large bars, these closure pores can get really long just to accommodate these lap splice lengths. And that's kind of counter to the advantages of using precast concrete. So DOTs want to do something that allows us to shorten up that closure pore so we can get more effective uh, and economical construction. And if you believe that, you know, hooked bars can be developed in shorter lengths than straight bars, sort of the governing wisdom would be, well, can I just take a hook bar and put in a lap splice and it'll just develop in a shorter length or I can transfer the force on a shorter length? Well, that's sort of the governing wisdom. And but we have to actually investigate this. Right. So the thought by the DOTs is they're interested is can we just use our existing hook provisions in the codes? and combine them with a lap splice and then design these hooked bar lap splices, which are short and straight bar lap splices. Well, you got to do a little bit of a dive, but when you look into how those equations are formulated for a hook bar development length, they're often through testing of these beam column joint specimens in which an embedded hook bar anchorage is pulled on in a simulated beam joint. And those are used to create our, you know, hook bar development provisions. However, you know, does that work in this application? Or now, instead of having this beam column joint, we're dealing with a flexural element. Um, we're dealing with a beam. So that's what we're trying to figure out. And so our objective in this research for VDOT is to understand the behavior of hooked bar lap splices, but also to develop these design recommendations for the design of such splices. In order to do this, we constructed and are constructing several of these beam splice specimens shown schematically here on the bottom in which we are making these precast concrete beams, which are comprised of two precast components. They're joined together with hooked bars overlapping. Then we cast a closure pore to emulate this real world precast concrete construction. And we have our beams. And we're deliberately designing the beams so that they will fail in bond related or anchorage related failure modes. We're not trying to get our typical, you know, flexural failure, concrete crushing and steel yielding, right? We need to study bonds. We need to create these bond failures. And to do that, there's a whole slew of parameters that we're trying to vary to understand how each of these elements affects the strength of these hooked bar lap splices. And so when we test these beams at four point bending, we're creating a constant mold region in the splice. So we have a very controlled understanding of the stress in our bar. And what that will look like when we then put that in a lab and get it off AutoCAD is something like this. Again, you can see that we're subjecting our beams to four point bending with the hydraulic cells and the ends and then we're um, trying to put a constant moment in those splices in the middle. And so we're testing a bunch of these beams and I'm just going to go over some of the general behavior that we've noticed in a couple trends. Um, distinct from this, these the failure modes for these specimens are different than things you would see in other bond literature. It's what we're calling two different fail, uh, phenomena which we're attributing to failure, which we're calling hook prying and hook side bulging in this presentation. And you can see this isometric view of one of the closure pores on the left in which you can see the hooked bar coming in, the tail going down the beam. But you can see at that hooked end of the bar at failure, the closure pore region tends to pop upwards. That's what we're calling prying and bulge outwards laterally from the beam. If you look at the side of the beam and you take a look at the end of the hook on the left that is closest to the face of the beam, you'll see that that end pops upward. Again, that's what we're calling hook prying. And if you look at the other beam and where the lead is put going into the closure pore, you see that there is not that vertical displacement that we're noticing. So we're seeing this phenomenon where the end hook anchored end of the bars tend to pop upwards and then bulge outwards. And these are phenomena that we believe are causing failure. And so dig into each of these mechanisms separately, we'll first start with hook prime. And when we look at that, you can see on the left again, you see a different beam, but it has that 
failure pattern we're seeing again where there's that vertical displacement at the end of the hooked anchor. And what we suspect is happening as you lose bond along the straight portion of the bar and it slips forward, you're engaging bearing inside the curvature of the hook and creating this localized compressive stress. Being that this element is in flexure, there is a compression strut that wants to form between the anchored end of the bar and the flexural compression zone. The vertical component of that strut, if you look at a node happening at the anchored end of the bar, demands that there be a vertical tensile tie to equilibrate the node, thus placing a vertical tensile stress field in the concrete element. You see evidence of this by the horizontal crack that shows up at the bottom of the beam, indicating that there's tension perpendicular to that direction, which is consistent with what we expect from the need of a tensile tie. So rupture of that uh, precludes the concrete from resisting this pry in action, which can lead to failure. The other mechanism that we notice is something we're terming hook side bulging. If we look at a plan view of our uh, specimens at failure, we believe that there's a pseudo strut and tie with load transfer mechanism occurring in these non-contact splices. If you look at the inner bars, they're preferentially oriented in such a way that they are laterally stabilized on other, either side by a diagonal compression strut. But if you go to the edge bars, edge bars only have a diagonal strut on one end of the anchored bar. And accordingly, if you deconvolute that strut into its vectorial components, there is a perpendicular component of that vector which is acting to push those edge bars out of the beam. And that's what we're calling hook side bulging. Again, in the absence of any sort of confining reinforcement perpendicular to those hooks, the concrete is being placed in tension, which we know that they don't like that very much. So it seems beneficial to then add a tension tie of, uh, from confining reinforcement in that direction to stabilize that uh, hook side bulging force. And so these are the phenomena that we are attributing to as causing failure. And so I just want to talk about a couple parametric studies we've done quickly is to kind of wrap up here. Um, here was a graph of a normalized bar strength or splice strength on either axis, one for unconfined specimens and one that did have confining reinforcement. And we plotted that against bar spacing, so your non-contact splice spacing. And what you noticed is that for the unconfined splices, as you went from a contact splice all the way on the left uh, to a six inch center center space on the right, you saw a decrease in strength of about 12%. Interestingly enough, when you go for a confined splice, as you go from four to six inches on center, we actually notice that the strength increased. And the reason we think this is because as you add confinement and you stabilize those hook side bulging tendencies, you're creating a wider beam and thus you have a wider plane of concrete to resist this prying action that is occurring. One of the other things that we looked at is what are some different configurations of confining reinforcement? How do they affect our strength? And so one on the left is what we're calling an interference bar or an interlocking bar, but this one we put a hooked end. We hook the end of the interlocking bar to hold those edge bars in if they want to bulge outwards. And then we had ties at 3 dB in the middle and stirrups at 3 dB on the right. Interesting to note is that for code provisions, either of the two arrangements on the right warrant the same reduction in uh, development length. And so if you plot the normalized strengths of all these uh, configurations, how well do they stack up against each other? Relative to the unconfined case on the left, the actual biggest increase in splice strength we observed was with the stirrups, which was 15 percentage points higher than the ties. The reason we suspect this was the case was because a tie is useful in resisting these hook side bulging forces, but don't do anything to help augment our prying resistance, right? On the other hand, stirrups have a transverse leg within the plane of splice reinforcement that acts to hold those hook side bulging forces together, but they also have those vertical legs which help to stabilize those prying node that happens and stabilize the uh, tensile field that's occurring in the beam. And so it wasn't surprising to see that the stirrups were actually better in this case. The interference bar actually had a substantial increase in splice strength as well due to anchoring the edge bars from falling outwards and hook side bulging. So just to wrap that up, um, we've noticed in this work so far that hooked bar lap splices transfer force through in-plane strut and tie mechanisms. They fail due to a combination of hook side bulging and hook prying, which also occur in concert with some splitting stresses that we observed. Um, and we also observed that as you increase the spacing for unconfined splices, you do get a decrease in your splice strength. However, when you add confinement, this pattern does not seem to exist. So looking to the future, what we're going to be doing is continuing these tests. And we're going to be beginning with um, some even larger bars, number 11s, 
Uh, we've principally been working with sixes and nines so far, so we'll be interested to see how those go. And then the ultimate end goal is, is to develop design guides and examples to use these in uh, bridge applications. All right, I think that's it. Can I take any questions?